and welcome. Have any of you seen the Barbie movie? <laughs> I just, I know that it's polarizing, but I thought the Kinnup stuff was really pretty funny. So that's our daily information that you are Kinnup, whoever you are, wherever you are. Um, okay. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Erin Barrickel. I am Assistant Director at the Center for Human Services Research, which is part of the CA team at Healthy Families New York. Um, I have been working over the last couple of years uh, with Isabel De Silva at uh, Pecani to develop a set, a couple of different sets, actually, of workforce competencies. Uh, we completed one about a year ago. That was for home visitors, so FSSs and FRSs, um, just sort of universally, I'm calling them home visitors because um, it's just easier and the names seem to be in a little bit of flux. And then I just recently finished a set of competencies for supervisors. Um, so we're going to be, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of an overview of the competencies, where they came from, where they're stored, some of the companion documents. Um, but it's too much really to go through in a webinar format. So those documents will be living on the website and yours, if you're interested in using them, they will be available for you to download and to use. Um, but my goal was really to try to develop um, a way that I sort of see using them and then being useful. Um, as Joe mentioned, probably a more helpful webinar would be how do you find uh, work for workforce out there in the ethosphere of people that are potentially looking for work. I don't have the magical answers to that question, unfortunately, um, but I've done a lot of work over my 18-plus uh, year career in hiring and developing different sets of interview questions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use the competencies in hiring at your programs. Um, so any questions that you have, feel free to either raise your hand or unmute yourself, um, ask away. I will do my best to answer those questions, um, but hopefully we can, you'll get at least a few ideas about how to use these competencies in the work that you're doing every day. Um, so again, we're going to go over a little bit of the history and development of the competencies and then really talk about how to use them to develop job descriptions, um, to develop interview questions, and then additionally how to orient your new um, employees using the self-assessment tool that was developed as one of the companion documents. I can't remember going to be lingering in the waiting room. We don't. So the competencies are basically organized into a different to, to four different domains. There is a fifth domain for the supervisor competencies, obviously, which includes supervision. Um, that would be an added domain for that group. Uh, we talk about healthy families practices, infant and child health and development, family functioning and community support, professional practice and process. So there are different competencies within those categories. Um, I'll show you if I can. Are you seeing the website now? Great. Um, so this is where all of the documents live. It is on the sort of the worker side of the HFNY website. Um, and we have the competencies. Right now, it's just the home visitor competencies. The supervisor competencies will be up there within a week or so. We're just having those sort of designs. They look a little nicer. For some of you, you've probably seen these before. Um, if you were at the previous um, webinar, I don't know why it's not coming up, but oh wait, here we go. So, oh, that didn't work. All right, let me bring up this one instead. So the competencies, you have sort of an overarching framework for more general types of competencies. But then if you scroll down, um, I, we really try to be mindful of developing lists of things that you can sort of either ask questions of your work, your workers um, about knowledge 
or you can see the skills in the observations that you're doing. Um, so we talked a little bit about do we add things like attitude. Um, attitude, while it's really critical for this work, is really hard to measure. Um, so we really tried to stick with things that you could actually observe, ask questions about, and understand um, where your workers are coming from. So each of the sort of overarching competencies are broken down into a set of knowledge and skills. Um, and that is true both for the worker competence, the home visitor competencies, as well as for the supervisor competencies. So this again is the um, home visitor competencies and the supervisor competencies will be shortly coming up. All right, let me see, go back here, a little Olivia in. Okay. So you see where that is. Okay. Any questions about the competencies themselves? So both sets were developed again using a multi-year process. We I talked to multiple programs across the country. Um, we talked to program staff. We had program staff review the competencies. So it was a pretty thorough process. Um, and I love this. Um, comic because I love Gilbert, but also because, I mean, how many of us, and this is how a lot of us end up doing hiring, right? It's sort of a gut judgment call. You have a short time to learn about someone, and it's really difficult to know in a short time if someone is going to be a good fit or not a good fit for your program. Um, and I think a lot of times we use these kind of instincts uh, and sometimes they're spot on. And some, I mean, I certainly had input into some good hires and I've had input into some not so good hires. So I think we need to do the best we can. And that's really why I tried to think about the hiring that, that you all do to try to maximize the time that you have and uh, make the most of it and learn the most you can about each candidate and what it is you're really looking for in a home visitor or a supervisor, um, again, in that short time you have. You know, you'll have a resume, maybe a cover letter, and then you might have an hour or a couple hours to meet with someone over an interview. Um, so what can you learn from them during this time that's really going to help you make a decision? So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is creating a job description. Um, so most of you, this is, for most of you, this is the first step. For some of you, you probably work in programs that have a pretty standard way of creating job descriptions. You might have some input into that, um, but if you're like where I work, you know, there is a little bit of a template, and we can add some stuff, but are, there are some things that we have to make sure that we put in there. Um, but I would encourage all of you when you're creating your job descriptions to think in terms of these competencies. So to think about what would you want a new visitor to know and what would you want a new home visitor to be able to do? Understanding that the intricacies of healthy families, there a lot of them are not going to come in with that specific knowledge about, you know, the, the types of um, assessment tools that we use. They're not going to necessarily know about the frog. Um, maybe they'd have some experience with doing ASQs. Um, but they're not going to know, they're not going to know the MIS necessarily. But what are those sort of foundational or fundamental skills and knowledge you want individuals coming in with? Um, and so think about those types of things when you're creating that job description. You also want to give your candidates useful information about what the job entails. Um, so you don't want to use jargon or language that isn't going to be meaningful to people reading a job description coming from outside healthy families. Um, so I gave some examples of um, things that, you know, I kind of came up with, but all of you in your programs will know, and as program managers, will know sort of what you're looking for in a candidate. Like, what do you want them to come in with? Is it that they're strength-based? Is it that they have experience um, doing home visiting type jobs? 
Um, is it that they just have a positive attitude or they're really good at working in teams or that they know how to utilize supervision? Um, all of those things are written into the competencies and all of them, I think, are important things to think about when you're thinking about writing those job descriptions. Okay. So I pulled um, a job description off of the website. And this was a recent one um, from a program. And I actually thought it was really good um, in terms of really um, communicating some of the key elements of the program, as well as thinking about some of those minimum requirements or what are the things that we want home visitors to bring with them into the job. Um, so you can see I highlighted some of the things, you know, I think about, again, when I was looking at job descriptions, what would you want a home visitor to know? What would you want them to be able to do? So what skills would you want them to have? Um, so conducting outreach and screening. So I thought that was pretty clear that, that that was a skill and that was something that the individual would be responsible for doing. Building partnerships with community service providers. So again, these are things that are pretty clear about what the responsibilities would be and would communicate to someone applying for the job, you know, what would be expected of them when they come into the Healthy Families Program. For minimum requirements, this is a pretty long list. Um, and you know, I think I always go back and forth about how many requirements do you want to list because it could be off-putting to someone that's looking through this. You know, if so, for example, successful parenting in our child care experience. So, you know, you might have someone that would be interested in the job that isn't a parent or maybe doesn't come from a background of child care but has a lot of these other things and has some of that basic knowledge and skills that you would want. So I, I would just recommend being careful with being really specific about some of those minimum requirements because you might put off you know, potential candidates if they see that and say, oh, they're looking for somebody that has kids or has worked in a daycare or you know, in a Head Start program and I don't have that experience, so I'm not even gonna bother applying. Uh, so again, you know, just think about those things as you're developing your um, your job descriptions and those minimum requirements. Some of the things are go like being able to pass a background check. That would probably be a critical one to put on there. I don't know how many applicants you would typically have that couldn't pass a background check, but that's also probably one of those um, that comes from your agency that you'd need, kind of need to put on there. Um, I think about things like strong listening skills. Um, I have an example, I think, on the next slide. When you're thinking about strong listening skills, what is it that you really, again, want the home visitor to be able to do? Do you want them just to be able to listen, or are they listening for certain things? Um, so on the next slide, I have listening with an ear toward identifying strength and resiliency factors. Um, so that might, you know, again, preset the person that's looking at this um, job description and this um, vacancy announcement and think, okay, do I, do I have that? Like, have I come from a program or do I have a strength-based orientation towards families or did I work somewhere where we're really just talking about you know, deficits and challenges and needs, and I haven't spent a lot of time. Um, it might, I don't think it would necessarily make anyone not apply for the job, but you're presetting them that this is going to be an expectation of working in this program, that, that we're a strength-based program, and we're looking at those um, resiliency factors and to build those things in our families. Um, so this is, again, just a job description that I kind of came up with based on ones that I had seen that I thought were really good, as well as thinking about the competencies. Um, and you can feel free to steal this or modify it or use it in any way that you think it might or might not be helpful for you. Any questions so far about job description stuff? Fantastic. Okay, let's talk for a little bit about developing interview questions. Um, oh, I got somebody waiting in the lobby. 
Okay. So back when I first started doing hiring, um, we often would ask questions in interviews like, tell us about your background. Tell us about your work history. Tell us about your educational history. And while those are in some ways useful, what I always found happening was candidates would basically regurgitate what was already on their resume. So they would talk about, you know, their bachelor's degree in psychology or the places that they'd worked, but never really getting into depth with what their types of experiences working were working in those environments. So I often felt like candidates would leave and I wouldn't necessarily know a whole lot more about them or how they would fit with the job we were advertising for than when I just was looking at their resume. So I started to think um, over sort of the course of time about how can we structure interviews? Because again, you only have maybe an hour, hour and a half to meet individuals um, before you have to make these kinds of decisions. So I would recommend as much as you can not taking time to ask them questions that you already know the answer from for from their resume. So if you already know what their background is work-wise and what their if they have a degree or a high school, whatever they have, you already know that. So don't take time covering that again. Think about things like that you would really want to know about someone. So what's their approach to home visiting? Maybe it's not strictly a healthy family's approach. But again, you're looking for things like, do they come from a strength-based perspective? Do, are they familiar with setting goals with families? Um, you know, what has their experience been? What they would want to learn from a family when they first meet them? So we're going to talk in a minute about some potential questions that you could ask and um, to, to kind of gauge that information. How would they handle or problem-solve tough situations? So this might get at, do they use supervision appropriately? How do they think about their colleagues? Do they feel like they're out there just kind of working all alone? Or do they have experience using their colleagues and their supervisor to help them with some of those tough family situations? How do they work as part of a team? How do they take care of themselves? Um, so do they already have some of their own internal resiliency factors to help them get through this difficult work? Um, and then, again, how do they approach interactions with cultural humility or view families through an equity lens? So these are all things that you can kind of structure your interview questions to tell you. This isn't a comprehensive list. You all have in your mind what you're sort of looking for in that individual, um, in that candidate. And I would really recommend that you take some time to think about that um, as you're thinking about what types of questions are going to get at that knowledge. So what we ended up doing at CHSR, and I, I've done this at other jobs too, is come up with basically scenario-based questions. Um, and one of my favorite interviews that I ever went on as a job candidate, um, they actually had me, it was a, it was a phone follow-up, it was a public health-based phone follow-up program, and they actually had me do um, a mock phone conversation with a current um, with a current staff member. And I thought it was a great way for me to sort of highlight my communication skills, even though I didn't really I didn't really know much about the program at the time and they didn't expect me to. Um, but I was able to basically show what I know, what I knew and what my skills were um, in a very practically based uh, way. So that is you know, kind of what I'm trying to, what we're trying to get at when we set up these scenarios. Um, so this is a very basic one that you would basically either read to the candidate or allow them to read on their own. Um, so it's just basically setting a very basic home visiting scenario. Um, so you've been asked to meet with Carla to see if she'd be a good fit for the program. She's eight months pregnant and was referred to Healthy Families by her OB clinic. So you schedule a time to meet with her on a Wednesday evening at her apartment, and that is important because you're sort of setting the stage that some of the hours of the work are going to be outside those normal business hours. Um, when you arrive for the visit, Carla, her boyfriend, and Carla's mother are there. So you notice it's a one-bedroom apartment, there's not much furniture, and no baby items that you can see. 
you described the Healthy Families program, and Carla and her boyfriend are really interested in getting set up with more support and services to help them get ready for the baby. Okay, so that's the sort of basic scenario. And so now you're going to basically start to ask them questions about sort of what they would do in that situation. Again, not assuming that they're going to know the Healthy Families approach, but you want to get a sense of sort of what their attitude, what their skills, what their knowledge is by asking them this, these questions. So what are some of the first things you would want to know about the family? And again, what you would be listening for as an interviewer is are the, is, are the responses that they give strength-based? Um, do they know sort of what questions to ask about prenatal development, about healthy or safe homes, about the type of support network they have, about what kind of, you know, where they might fall in terms of ACEs, um, with the prior trauma that the family might have experienced. So those are the kinds of things that you're listening for um, in that response. The next question could be, what are some things about the family's history that you would want to know? Again, thinking about, would they ask about things like if there's a history of trauma, um, if there is, you know, any other kinds of things you would be sort of listening for? And so what are some things about the family's current situation that you would want to know? Um, and then, again, you can pick up some, so it's a one-bedroom apartment, there's not much furniture and no baby items. So would the candidate want to know a little bit more about that? Would they want to know if there's a crib or a safe sleep area for the baby? Um, so it is a way for the candidate to show how they would approach a home visit. Does that make sense? So then the next sort of following that scenario a little bit further, the family decides to enroll in services. And during the next home visit, you want to get some more information about the parent's history. During the conversation, the boyfriend gets up and grabs a beer from the fridge and lights up a cigarette. He mentions his father was not around when he was a kid and he hopes to be a better dad to this baby. He recently got a new job after completing an outpatient drug abuse program for an addiction to painkillers. So Questions that might relate to that. What are some things you might want to ask Dan after he sort of finishes telling his story? Thinking about, you know, again, what would those, what would somebody that's potentially working effectively in the Healthy Families Program want to know about? Um, what are some of the things that are important for Dan to know? Does that person, the candidate, know about some of the local resources that are available for either more outpatient treatment or any other types of services or resources that might be important for that individual to have? Again, you're thinking about and listening for substance abuse history risk assessment and knowledge of available community resources and any other things that might tie to those competencies that you would want someone to have coming into the program. And so finally, to kind of follow through all the way to the end, at the end of the visit, Dan and Carla get into a very heated argument over money. Dan throws his beer can again. This is not like a scenario. You could write your own scenario. I was just developing my own here. And Carla's head and storms out of the apartment, slamming the door behind him as he calls you a bad name. So Carla's visibly shaken by this and asks you to leave, saying she needs some time to herself. And so here you might be thinking about, all right, not just what, how she would end the home, the candidate would end the home visit, but also how they might move forward from that. So what would the next step? for that individual be in their own head? Would they go back to the office and want to talk to their supervisor about that, want to talk to some of their colleagues that have more experience about that? Um, what might they do later in the day to help themselves cope with what they experience? So any self-care routines that they um, might undergo to, um, to help them process the situation? Um, the other thing I was thinking as I was um, thinking about these competency-based questions is to offer up a question, um, which I didn't include here, but I was thinking about it after the fact, about celebrating successes. So you could have sort of a, an additional scenario where, you know, Carla has a healthy baby and, you know, they're doing the home visit, first home visit after 
um, the baby comes home and how does it, how would the candidate want to celebrate that success? with the family um, to kind of, again, put in that positive, that strength space, that positive spin, um, because home visiting, there are a lot of, obviously, such successes that one would want to celebrate. It's not just all about the the bad things that happen. There's obviously a lot to celebrate within the program. So that could be an additional question. So some other competency-based questions that might not necessarily be scenario-based. Um, you could ask questions about how uh, the candidate might interact differently with a family who is not of the same race, race, ethnicity, or cultural background. Um, a lot of you probably asked a similar question to this. Um, again, looking at the cultural humility, equity, equity, diversity, and inclusion links right up to some of the competencies that are in those lists. Look asking a question about organization. Obviously, that is very clearly going to need to be a requirement of someone coming into this program. They're going to need to be able to organize their day, organize their workload. Um, so that would be something important that you would want to know. And then also about documentation. Obviously, as um, a CHSR person, I'm always focused on the documentation and the data entry. Um, but you can also decide if that's something that is really important to you for new people coming in. Are they gonna know how to use the MIS? No, but do they have experience with either electronic data collection systems or at least taking case notes and you know filling out forms and that kind of thing? So those are all things that you might wanna make sure that you know about the candidate before they leave that you might not get from the resume and the cover letter. Are there other things that you guys can think of that you might want to know about a candidate or that questions that you all ask during interviews that you think are either really good questions or really important things to know about candidates before you um, either make an offer or don't make an offer? Erin, I just think about that idea, um, you know, because folks work so independently out in the field, getting a sense of someone's willingness to admit if they don't know something to to not have an answer to something and so mm -hmm. i think what's really great about the example questions you have here is that you know they're very reflective and behavior based they're not oh are you able to handle this yes or no you're, you're actually asking questions that are inviting someone to share a time or tell you how you handled that. And so sometimes those kinds of questions to get, you know, can you tell me about a time when you were doing something or whatever and you, you didn't know what to do? How did you handle that? What did that mm -hmm. look like? Because again, people are out and what you want to know is that they're going to know enough to push the pause button and come back and get an answer or find out what to do um, and not feel like the expectation is that you will know everything when you get out there. Absolutely. That's a really good point, Carolyn. Um, I like the examples you gave. When we interview for our FSS, we have several questions with an ABC mm -hmm. example. You know, there's no heat, the stove's not working, and there's a kerosene heater. What are you doing? You know, or yeah. uh, if you have a family group and someone who you know is contagious with whatever shows up to the group how do you handle that mm -hmm. you know do, do you pull them aside quietly and then quietly escort them out until they get the medical thing taken care of and you know that was a perfect one especially during covid absolutely you know so there were different ones where they had to think on their feet mm -hmm. you know um possibly list a local resource that could handle the heat situation and the stove situation. And the we also asked them, why do you want to work for healthy families? What do you know about healthy families? That gives us an idea. Did you go online and look us up? Mm -hmm. Did you, what about the agency? Because a lot of the programs that we refer people to are right within our own agency. Yep. You know, we, it's, it's a phone call and email away. Yeah, we can get you a stove. We have some furniture too for this person that was homeless and needs this. So, you know, so we asked them, what do you know about us and why do you want to work for us? Yeah. 
That's a really Did you good. do the homework? Did you really look to see where you're asking for this job, but did you look to see what we do? Yep. And how we do it, you know? So we we just we just wonder, okay, you know, or is this just a job? Mhm. You know, or are you really interested in doing what the job entails? Yep. Yeah, I think if you like didn't want to ask that question, I think that's a perfectly valid question. And if you it didn't want to ask that type of question, because someone could just regurgitate what they kind of read on your website if they're just sort of looking for a job. But you could also ask them more generally, like, how do you what do you like about the idea of home visiting? What do you like? What do you how do you see this fitting into, you know, what you know or what you like about about jobs or careers? Um, mm-hmm. So you could keep it more general or make it more specific to the healthy families. Um, and and what you said about like the kerosene heater and those very specific examples, I really like those. And I also like so sometimes we'll say, can you pull from can you pull an example from an experience that you've had in jobs that you've had um, that would either answer this question or if not, just explain how you think you would you know, approach the situation if you were faced with it. Um, because that gives individuals either something, like something very specific, a very specific situation that they could explain. Oh, this is, oh yeah, that happened to me, you know, in the home visiting program I worked for, this other program I worked for, you know, a year ago, and this is what we did. This is what we were able to hook the family up with. Um, and you'll have other candidates that maybe haven't had that specific situation, but similar that could also answer um, those questions just a little differently. I don't know why my camera's not showing and my computer's acting up and this is a new computer. That's okay. I'm supposed to be on the screen, but I have a picture of your face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even see that. So no. <laughs> it's like, what's going it's on? It's in my mind's eye. It's not actually okay. on the screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anybody else have any particular questions or things that they ask about they think that they think are particularly effective during job interviews? Okay, great. Well, those are all really, really good examples. Um, Oh, what does self-care mean to you? Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. This is great. Um, Let's see. I added a couple down. Which yeah, added, great. Which Thank you, Joe. Useful. Um, so, we try yeah. to tweak our process each time we have to hire based on what we've learned before and stuff. Mm-hmm. We like to ask about a supervision one because healthy families have a lot more supervision than most people are used to or comfortable yeah. with. Um, plus that reflective piece. We've hired people in the past where they are completely adverse to meeting with a supervisor for an hour and a half, two hours each week, or having a supervisor observe them on visits and they just feel like it's micromanaging, that somebody's always over my shoulder and stuff. So we kind of want to get an idea of what their feelings are about that, you know, real-time feedback and regular meeting with a supervisor and stuff. Yeah. Um, we also ask about that interpersonal conflict. We have come to learn in six years have I been here that um, there's a lot of personalities in this work. And <laughs> um, so you know, agree to disagree, disagreeable stuff, unacceptable stuff, that type of thing, the whole team commitments and all that. So we add in there about situations that might not have went well with a coworker or a supervisor and how they responded to that and also what they thought might have been going on. And then we've added a self-care one there because this work is heavy and yeah. most people get into this work because they are helpers. They want to do everything for everyone. Um, and that can burn you out very quickly and plus cross some very serious boundaries. Uh, so we like to see how they kind of keep that contained and keep their focus on their own wellness and health versus always giving, giving, giving and not keeping that in check. So let me ask you about the questions that you ask about sort of people's comfort with being supervised sort of more or more closely than they would in other programs. Have you been able to weed out potential employees or has that been a a non-starter for you if um, you sort of don't, if you feel that resistance to having that type of supervision? Um, not since we started asking it. So we started asking it in response to uh, two different people that we hired back in the fall of 2019. 
And then we started asking this question and stuff, and we haven't like, quote unquote, disqualified any applicants based on their responses. I do try to frame it in a different way than supervision is in that somebody to be micromanaging you or watching over you. I'm yeah. not a sports guy and my staff always laugh at me for making sports analogies, but I I phrase supervision in the context of coaching, like a coach is on the sidelines watching the game, giving you real-time feedback and stuff. And that's what a healthy family's supervisor is. They're giving you that real-time feedback and helping reflect on what went well, what didn't go well, what you kind of have to do in practice before you get back out there on the home visits. Um, so I try to frame it in that. And then when I've done that, um, it kind of takes a different tone in the interview because um, when it's presented just as supervision, somebody checking on this and you got to talk about this, uh, people think that it's micromanaging and I'm independent. I don't want somebody watching over me and stuff. So, um, so, so far it hasn't disqualified anybody when I explain it in the context of coaching and stuff like that, skill development yeah. versus supervision. That's good. But and I think that also brings up a really a really good point um, that I think it's worth mentioning that not only is this sort of hiring process an opportunity for program managers and supervisors to sort of look at candidates and see if it might be a good fit, it's also an opportunity for you as programs to effectively communicate parts of the job that are really critical to the individual that might, that has a possibility, like Joe mentioned, maybe it wouldn't be a good fit. But you've put it out there, Joe, that this is the type of supervision that we do, and this is the expectation of working in Healthy Families New York. So if that individual isn't comfortable with that level of closeness and that relationship with a supervisor, then maybe it wouldn't be a good fit. So that's actually giving important information to the candidate um, that could be that could really weigh on their minds and and make a difference. And you wouldn't want to hire someone that thought they were okay with it and didn't or didn't know what they were getting into. And then all of a sudden there is this really close this expectation of this really close relationship and they don't feel comfortable with it. So then again, you've like wasted time over a match that wouldn't be, that isn't really appropriate. And you're probably going to find that that staff member doesn't stay on board for very long um, if they're not, and not just the supervision piece, but any of the really important and critical pieces of healthy families. Um, you want to take that opportunity during the interview or during your conversations with candidates to give them that really important information that you think in your experience has either been caused a good match or a not good match between the home visitor and the, the program, if that makes sense. So you want to take that opportunity to sort of have that conversation. And then, so here's just some additional questions that you might ask for supervisor candidates. Um, you know, again, talking about skills and giving them opportunities to give um, examples of times when maybe they haven't been a supervisor before, but maybe they've had a leadership role or been, you know, a home visitor that has more experience. And so they've mentored some of the newer staff. Um, so how did they, you know, handle that? What did they, what was their experience? So give them a chance to talk about, about those types of situations. Okay, so I want to just talk for a minute or two about what you do, because, of course, we're data people. But how do you organize and start to look at that interview information that you've gotten? Um, one of the things that we've developed here, which might or might not be useful to you, um, I always have a tough time taking notes just freehand during, inter really during any conversation that I'm having with someone. So I like to have more structure. So what am I looking for? And then like really just being able to make some quick notes so I can stay engaged in the conversation. Um, not everyone is like that. Some people prefer to just take free hand notes, which is totally fine. Um, but if you're like me and you'd like to have some more organization to your data that you're collecting, the <laughs> conversation that you're having, I shouldn't say data. Um, we, we use a form that's similar to the one that's up on the screen here. So for each question, 
we sort of have different ratings. Um, so for the question, what are some of the first things you want to know about the family? So that goes back to one of those first questions that you might ask a candidate. So what are you looking for in those responses? And then you can sort of wait, rate the response on this four-point scale. My next example has a three-point scale. You can use as many points or not points as you want um, from weak to exceptional. And then you can take some notes about that, that certain things that stood out to you or something you might want to go back to or ask a follow-up question about. So um, that's for this one. And then you could also use a three-point scale. Um, it just sort of gives you a way to, in the moment, either take some notes or kind of capture what that candidate is saying and how you kind of feel like they might rate um, for each of the questions. Um, so that is, you know, again, a way to organize the information. You typically don't have a lot of time to go around and around if it's just one, I mean, most times there's going to be more than just one person doing an interview. So you might have a conversation with that other person, or maybe it is just you and you need to go back and look at what you, how that interview went and then make a decision about whether you're going to offer the job to someone or not. So this organizing that information can help you sort of make a more informed decision about whether or not you think the candidate is is worth um, an offer. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. So let's fast forward to that happy ending when you're actually able to hire someone and they are coming on board and you are starting to think about orienting them to their new job. One of the things that I like about these competencies is because you can use them all the way through a person's time at Healthy Families. So you can use it right from writing a job description all the way on through to ongoing development, professional development. Um, it can really be a tool that you use, um, again, like I said, really throughout that person's experience at Healthy Families. So these, these self-assessment tools we developed both for our home visitor competencies as well as our supervisor competencies. They're both, um, well, this one is available on the website currently. The supervisor one will be up on the website shortly. And what I like about this is it actually, so it's, it can be both a collaborative tool as well as an individual tool. So how I would see using it is really sitting down with the new staff member you know, either the first couple days that they've come on board and have them go through sort of each of the different competencies and then sub-competencies to see where they think they have good a good foundation, good knowledge, good skills, or where they think they need some sort of immediate professional development or learning, whatever way that, that might be. Um, and then the supervisor, whether that's the supervisor or the program manager of that individual, can really have a conversation with that person. Okay, you have a background in, you know, you have a bachelor's degree in psychology, so you have a good foundation in child development. So maybe where we focus, and I know that there is a whole set of trainings that individuals have to go through, um, but you can really focus in some of those initial conversations, some of that initial onboarding on those areas where they either feel like they need more support or you really feel like through that interview process and through that initial onboarding process that they might need some additional support. So this tool gives you the opportunity to write in some comments, to talk with them about where they might get some further support or resources or training on those different competencies, um, really hoping to make them stronger, either build their knowledge or build those, build those skills in that, in those different areas. Um, and again, you can use this as an initial onboarding tool. You can use it at different points along their orientation and training process. You know, maybe you do it when they first come on board and then at three months and then at six months and then at a year to see sort of how they've developed, it gives them a chance to, to reflect a little bit on the things that they know and the things that the skills that they've been able to build. And it gives you as a supervisor a chance to, to think about that, what they know and what they've learned. And again, where they might need some additional support 
or where they've really come um, far in the time that they've been there. Um, so it can be a celebration of success as well as a, a chance to identify some of those areas where they might need additional training or support. Erin, I just, you yep. know, this also, I, I see it sort of that orient, like onboarding newer, you know, there's so much that takes so long for people to learn in doing this, right? So you come out of train, you go into training and often in training, folks don't even know what they don't know yet. Yep. They get out there and they start to realize, oh yeah, well that was in training, but I didn't think to ask because I didn't even, you know, it just seems like this would be a great tool that you could use even past that first year, you know, because things mm -hmm. change or maybe it's a different practice that that they're now using that that they didn't use in that sort of initial. So this just seems like it would be a great sort of ongoing um, tool to use to support professional development. I'm glad you think that. I like it too. <laughs> I hope other people like it too. We tried to set it up, um, and Isabel, I think, did a great job helping to set up this particular document um, and really thinking a lot about um, places where you'd need an opportunity to write in some comments and to expand on some of the um, additional notes and, and make sure that there was space to write in, you know, where there's resources, where you can find the resources, what trainings you could potentially access. Um, so I think it's really good for that. As a, as a researcher, I tend to get focused on the Likert scale because it's more easily measurable. Um, but I think that those places where you can add in those comments and sort of expand on some of that is really, really important too. Um, so I, I do hope and think that it can be a useful tool for, for all of you to use, um, with your, with your home visitors. Any questions about orienting? new employees or things that you do in your programs that you think are particularly effective in orienting and onboarding new employees. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? general questions or comments. Good. Well, I must have done a great job then. <laughs> um, what, I, what I am hoping to do is sort of expand a little bit on the idea of these like scenarios and some of the scenario-based questions um, to add some additional potential interview questions um, and kind of put them together in a list and put them up on the website um, along with these competency documents. Um, because I really, my goal isn't to make all of you go back and sort of rethink the wheel on how you ask um, and how you, what types of questions you ask during interviews and how you onboard employees. Um, I'd like to kind of offer you some options and some choices if you're looking for, you know, how do I how do I measure this or how do I ask about this? Um, so if you have particular areas where you are hoping to, you know, where you'd like to know more about a candidate and you're sort of struggling a little bit on how or you just don't have the bandwidth to think about how would I ask a question that might, you know, get at that particular topic. Um, please let me know. Um, go, please feel free to email me with any questions that you have. I love thinking about this stuff. It's really weird, but because I've spent so many years hiring, like I just, I think about it all the time and I think about, um, you know, it's an iterative process, even for us at CHSR about every time we do it. Joe, like you said, you just to learn a little bit from the experience and you learn as you're onboarding and orienting employees, all right, what should we have asked about? Or, or maybe this was like, we just, this question wasn't really, people aren't really answering this question the way that we really, we're not getting the information that we hope we'd be able to get. Um, so definitely feel free to pick my brain, email me. Um, I'm happy to think about it and, and give you any um, resources or thoughts that I might have uh, on this. Um, but I know it's a challenge and I know this doesn't solve 
the problem of getting people to apply to your job. Um, but I hope that it, what it does do is help ensure that the candidates that are coming in and interviewing, that you have the best information and the most information than you can get in that short period of time to make good decisions both on your end and the candidate's end um, to hope that it would be a good fit. So when you're bringing people on, you know, they, they're they not surprised by anything, that there's a good um, rapport and communication already established. Um, and that it really eases that transition process into a new job. Great. Does anybody have any final thoughts or comments? I'll add to what you were saying about yeah. um, finding that balance between putting enough, but not too much. We struggle back and forth with that um, because we don't want to make it too generic and then have somebody be completely come into something that they don't expect. Um, but then we don't want to put too much and scare people away. So we've, we've tweaked that back and forth as well over the years of how much is enough without being too much and being um, enough explanation without scaring people away. And um, I think it's still a lot that we put in there, um, but kind of our argument or thought process behind it is that maybe it'll peak some questions. You know, they come to the interviews like, well, I read this in the job description. Can you tell, tell me more about that? Or what is this? Or what is that? And open up the conversation for more. Some mm -hmm. people, it doesn't, some people it doesn't, which that is um, kind of telling to me, too because of all the stuff that we do put in job description. And one of our first questions is, do you have any questions for us based on the job description, based on what you've learned about us, um, based on what you might have found on our website or the Healthy Families website, what do you have for questions for us? When they come in with nothing, that kind of tells me you didn't read all those bullet points because there's stuff on there you should not know. <laughs> like, yeah. <wrong. laughs> right. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so if, they're not coming, if they're not coming to us curious and, and wondering about what this is, then it tells me that they might not have the curiosity to work with a family and do a frog or do yeah. a home or and I mean I think it says a lot, Joe, that you that you spend time thinking about it. Um, you know, I think that as long as you're being intentional about the items that you include and you have a reason for doing what you do, I think that that is reasonable because everyone is going to have a different and every organization is sort of going to have a different slant on it. But as long as you are, you know, questioning and you have a reason for why you're, you're doing what you do and you see that result when you're in an interview, you know, that somebody isn't asking any questions. Well, how could that be? So, I mean, I don't disagree that a long job description is appropriate. I think it just needs to be the things that you include need to be intentional, not you, the, the more general view. Um, the things that individuals are including on these descriptions, again, should be intentional and there should be, um, you know, a reason behind all of it. So. And Aaron, you mentioned something too, and we we talk about this that sometimes everybody could be great on paper, all this, and you, there's just this gut feeling that you have something's it's and it's not, you know, I'm not going to say it's not based in reality because it is. It's super important to listen to that, but sometimes it's just that place where whoever's interviewing will say, you know, just something is feeling. Just like it's not working. Yeah. And sometimes you can be very clear about what it is. It may be Joe just like, well, they didn't come prepared or they didn't. And other times it's it's a little less tangible, um, but important to be able to talk about it and, and try and figure out where that's coming from. Because often that gut, when we don't listen to it, sometimes, not always, sometimes that can come back. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And it's how you get it's it's like that attitude or like that intangible thing that you can't quite put your finger on, but you only have this short period of time. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta ask the questions that are going to either make you go, hmm, or make you go, oh yeah, no, that this is definitely the right, the right fit. Um, so yeah, for sure. 
All right. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to me. And I, I hope that you were able to gather some tidbit of resource or something that will be useful to you. Um, and certainly pass along the word for other people that might be interested that this will be up on the website in the next couple of weeks. Um, so thanks again for taking the time and I hope to see you all again soon. See everybody. Thank you, Erin. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone.